Okay, we've been looking at uh, the subject of the seven mountains of influence mm. and uh, how God calls uh, us into different spheres of influence. And, and to be a minister of the Most High God doesn't mean that you become a full-time pastor only. Um, that there are people that are involved with media. They're like the media missionaries. Mm. Uh, there are people that have been gifted and called uh, as musicians and singers, and you could call them the musicianaries uh, because their, their mission field is in the sphere of music. And, and uh, God will even call people into arts and entertainment or even into government. And so the seven mountains, uh, these are seven mission fields. Mm. And uh, some people are called to be doctors, and, and God's called you to be a doctor. But, you know, uh, what would Jesus do in a hospital as a doctor? And what wouldn't Jesus do? I've got a very good friend, and he's a doctor, a very passionate believer. And as a Christian doctor, he refuses to do abortions. He, he refuses to... And even, um, I know some doctors that have refused to do abortions or refused to uh, actually um, pass someone on to a doctor that will do an abortion, and as a result, they lost their job. And, and uh, so as a, as a Christian, there's a sacrifice when we go into the different arenas. And, you know, Christians in business are tempted to do all sorts of illegal things so that they can make more money. And we've got to understand what does the Word of God say about business? What does the Word of God say about government? God doesn't call everybody to be a full-time pastor. Um, and in order for us to influence our nation, we need to be involved with other spheres. We need Christians in media. We need strong Christians in art and entertainment. And, and, and people that climb the mountain, the picture of a mountain is a mountain is something you need to conquer. Mm -hmm. you know, they say, oh, they conquered Mount Everest. It means that they, they're able to climb to the top of Mount Everest. They got to the top. And, and, and so in life, our calling, it's like a mountain that we need to conquer. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's battles. The seven mountains, you could also say they're the seven battlefields because... The enemy is opposing us, rising to higher levels of influence on our mountain of influence. And um, so as we looked at this subject, we've been looking now at this, the concept of convergence. And convergence is when two lines meet. That's a convergence, uh, where two lines meet. They converge. And we saw that as God is... Growing us and developing us to become 100% who He created us to be. Now we're going through different stages, like climbing up the mountain, or like a, a child that goes through primary school from grade 1 to grade 2 to grade 3, then into high school and then on to college or university. There are, there are stages that we are going through as we move towards becoming fully the person God has called us to be and doing fully what He wants us to do in the earth. And uh, so we saw that in order to come to convergence, you've got these two lines. And um, it's from zeros here and, and tens here. Zeros there and tens there. And, and our goal in life is to reach the 100% mark. And, and so this is the person, when God looks at you, it's the eyes of God going on here, I'm not trying to... Uh, Minimalized God, but anyway, but, but God has a vision for your life. Did you know that? Now, a lot of people, what is the, what is, you know, what is your vision for your life? Well, I'm not really interested about what your vision is. You know, I'm not caring about what is your dream. God gave a young man, he was a, a young man, possibly a teenager, and he gave this man a dream. He gave this boy a dream. Joseph got a dream. And the dream wasn't his dream, it was God's dream, and God gave his dream to Joseph, and then God's dream for Joseph became Joseph's dream for Joseph. And so the goal is not what is your dream and what is your vision, it's what is God's dream. What is God's vision for your life? When God is looking at you, He sees your potential to become something. He sees your full potential, the 100% of who He is. He can see the potential in you, but can you see what God sees? That's what Scripture declares. 
It's in the book of Proverbs. It says, For, for lack of vision, my people perish. For lack of vision, my people perish. And so that word for vision, by the way, in the Hebrew is revelation. We talk a lot about revelation. Revelation is when the curtain opens. When the curtain's shut, you don't see what's out there. The curtain's shut. But revelation, the curtain opens, and then you see the unseen. And so it's where there is no revelation, which means it's a vision that comes from God. Where people don't have a vision that comes from God, there's a lot of people that have vision, but it doesn't come from God. They have dreams that don't come from God. But when you have a vision that comes from God, you will not perish spiritually, Amen. but you will succeed. You will be victorious. You will overcome. Amen. So we need to have the vision that God has Amen. for our lives Amen. so that we do not perish. That's right. So understanding how Scripture is working here. And by the way, we looked at this... Uh, we looked at the example of Adolf Hitler as somebody who, who reached a 10 in regards to developing their gifts and their skills. Adolf Hitler got a 10. Okay? So here he is. His giftings, his skill, his talent, this side of things. His gifting, his skill as a public speaker, his leadership gifting, uh, his, his ability to motivate people for a cause. Uh, he was a visionary for the nation of Germany. He brought them out of the deepest, darkest economic crisis and he made them an economic power. That's what Adolf Hitler did. He brought them out of depression and made them a world ruler. But the problem was, even though he reached a 10 here, he didn't reach a 10 here. This is character. Godly character. This is uh, the, the level of faith. Faith is it's not about me, it's all about God. That's right. And he had zero for faith. In fact, um, he had so much faith in himself, he became an antichrist. And so he didn't reach 100% of what God wanted. He's over here, he's 100% of what the devil wanted for him. So, so you've got to understand, um, you need to, in life, develop your character, your faith. Understand what, there's a really important word here called passion. Adolf Hitler had a 10 for passion. Can I tell you? Mao Zedong had a 10 for passion, but Mao Zedong didn't become all that God wanted him to be. He became all the devil wanted him to be. Mao Zedong was an antichrist figure. But, but he got 10 for passion. This is a really important word. Passion is actually here behind the eye. You need, you need passion behind your vision. Okay? Because the passion will drive you. That's right. The passion will influence and motivate you right. so that you get to this place. And the passion is like the power of the engine of an aeroplane. Right. You've got this powerful power and the aeroplane goes. So we, we need to have passion, but our passion must be married to the vision of the Lord. See, Adolf Hitler didn't have a clear understanding of God's vision for his life. He didn't even acknowledge God. He, he was worshipping self. Mao Zedong worships self. And as much as we worship self, we'll fall short of this place. Because this is, this is who God wants us to be, but it's not a worship of self. So as you move towards this point, this is the Christian life I'm explaining here, um, there are different levels of convergence. So it's not just one, there is one final level that we're aiming towards, but in the Christian life, you, you can actually look at yourself and say, I should be at this time at this level. If you stay at the same level 10 years, there's something wrong. So in your character, if you've got a character flaw, for example, let's say uh, you have uh, anger issues. Now, there, there's such a thing as a holy anger, by the way. That's part of passion. In anger is a major motivator as long as it's godly, holy anger. You know, Jesus had it. Holy anger, zeal for my father's house consumes me, you know, is passionate in, in his drive. But if you've got uh, unholy anger because of bitterness or resentment in life, um, that anger is part of your character. It needs to be dealt with. And so, yeah, when you're a new Christian, you've got an anger problem. Well, new Christians are babies. We say 
They're a born again, newborn again baby. And so you expect babies to be pretty immature. You don't go, well, this is a two month old baby. Why isn't that baby making dinner for mum and dad? You know, why doesn't that baby go down the supermarket and buy groceries? You know, like, that baby should be working, you know. Why does that baby expect five star treatment? Well, babies are babies. So, in, in God, God doesn't expect you to be 100% up here when you're a newborn again believer. You know, God has a, he's got a, a fair expectation of you according to the level you're at. Okay? But, you know, what God does expect is after five years that that baby is not pulling its nappies anymore. That that baby is now able to go around and do certain things and, and talk. It should be talking and walking by now. The baby crawling upon the floor, but it's not a baby, it's five years old. Okay, so understand that convergence, you can look at your life and ask yourself, are you still moving upward and forward? Mm. That it says in Scripture that the Lord is, is taking us heavenward. What does that mean? You know? It doesn't just mean we're going to die and go to heaven. It does mean that, but, but it talks about there's a heavenly vision that God has for us. Paul was focused on that heavenly vision. Upward and onward. And, and, and it says that God has taken us from glory to glory, from faith to faith. In other words, our faith should be moving to higher levels. What does it mean, glory? Glory means our ability to reflect the glory of God like Jesus reflected the glory of God. In other words, showing the love and the character and the nature of God wherever we go. So can you imagine someone like Adolf Hitler who reaches the 10 and they're, and they're skilled and they're motivating a nation and they're doing all of these things, but he has a 10 in regards to Christian character, that he's full of love and compassion and he's, and he's, he's got his, um, his vision is fully that of Christ Jesus. Because ultimately, this is Jesus that we're going to look at. Who does God want you to become? He wants you to become like Jesus. Okay? And that's why you always ask yourself the question, if Jesus was working in the restaurant washing dishes, how would Jesus do it? If Jesus was working in a childcare centre looking after kids, how would Jesus do it? Okay, so that's um, just going back, because we've got some new people here, a bit of an introduction. I want us to look at the book of Numbers. In the Bible, there is a book of Numbers. There's a lot of Numbers in the Bible. Mm. Book of Numbers. And we're up to chapter 13. It says, um, starting with verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, uh, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to Israel. For each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders or one of its princes. It wasn't the main leader, it was one of the young men, one of the princes of the tribe. And uh, so if for each of the twelve tribes you need to send a prince. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out. From the desert of Paran, and all of them were leaders or princes of Israel. So, there you go. We've got the elephants jumping around. Okay, now, so we're going to change this picture a bit. I'll just grab where's the tissue's gone. I need a wipe of tissue. There. We've got a tissue there. Yay! Maybe he's got tissue. Used them a few times. <laughs> okay, so we're going to keep this, this picture going on here. Just going to rub some of this stuff out, though. I want the eye. The eye is very important for today's lesson. 100%. Okay, now God had led Israel out of bondage in Egypt. So in the Bible, Egypt always speaks of uh, the fallen world system, the kingdom of darkness. And, and God had taken his people out of Egypt, or God takes his people out of the kingdom of darkness. And then he leads them through the wilderness. And it's only supposed to be a short journey of less than one month. 
And he leads them through the wilderness to the promised land. And so God's vision for them was to enter this promised land. And then once they enter the promised land, they need to lay hold of the promised land. Uh, city by city, region by region, they needed to war and to battle and lay hold. So there was a coming out of and a going into. Uh, that's why scripture declares that God, if you obey him and obey his word, he'll bless all of your going out and your coming in. He'll bless you as you're going out of the things of the past, and he'll bless you as you're moving into the things of the future. That's what it means, the going out, the coming in. And by the way, the good shepherd leads them out and leads them in. So, here they come to the gateway of the promises. Canaan is the promised land. This is God's vision for them to take this land. This is what we call their inheritance. All the way through Scripture, it was Israel's inheritance. Now, a father gives a son an inheritance in the biblical times. By the way, you women are sons, sons of God. Which means, man and woman, we have an inheritance from God the Father. Okay? So, God has an inheritance for you. Have you ever asked Him what it is? Part of your inheritance will be taking the, the mountain that God has asked you to take. That's part of your inheritance. So, it's not just... You see, when God takes Israel out of Egypt... Then God leads Israel through the wilderness. And in the wilderness, then God has to take Egypt out of Israel. Do you see the difference? First, He takes them out of Egypt. Now God's got to take Egypt out of them. That's what wilderness is. is a time of testing, a time of transition and transformation. I shared that on last uh, Wednesday night. Change and transition are different. People can have all sorts of changes happening and they fail to transition into the new season because transition is about your heart and your mind. That's supposed to be a brain, by the way. It looks like somebody's been playing football with it. So there can be change. For example, when I was on the mission field, I was called from Australia to, into China to the, the Tibetan people and China and Tibet has a totally different culture so I was taken out of Australia put into China and I was ministering to Tibetan people and I realized for me to minister to Tibetan people I had to change my heart my mind had to change I had to learn a new language I had to learn a new culture I had to learn to eat different types of food. By the way, I love Chinese food. So it's, that wasn't hard. So this is interesting. Remember on Wednesday, if you were here, I shared how what often happens, the religious spirit can't let go of the old season and it can only see Jesus as he was uh, and, and only see Jesus doing what Jesus was doing. They can't see what who Jesus is now in the new season and what Jesus is doing now because Jesus changed because of who he is and what he's doing in the new season. There is a change. And um, so it's very interesting because a lot of the missionary, I, I, was what the, I was acculturating very fast, which means I was becoming a Tibetan to the Tibetan people. I was, I was laying hold, this is my life mission. This is what I'm called into. I embraced it. And so all the change around me, I was transitioning into very quickly and I was experiencing minimal, what they call culture shock or culture stress. Um, I wasn't stressed out as much as some of the other ones. We had these American ladies, and I'll tell you what, they're older than me, and these American ladies, all they could ever do was this. You know what they could do? So I really miss apple pie. I really miss my mum and dad. I really miss my home culture. And the whole time, they're, in, they're called to go into Tibet as a missionary, and all they can ever do is talk about America. Mm. And so, for them, they were stressed out all the time about being in China. They were stressed out with the language. They were stressed out with the culture. They're complaining. They're negative, and, and they're negative. And they're having headaches. And you sit down and talk to them. I didn't want to talk to them after a while because they complain. Why? It's because all they can ever do is think about where they were, not where God has them now. 
and where God is leading them. In other words, the change had happened, but their hearts weren't changing and their minds weren't changing. Therefore, their stress increased. Stress in life increases when you resist the changes that God is bringing. And so I was very quickly learning language. I was very quickly um, being effective in the new mission field. But the other people, that, as, because they couldn't let go of the old season, their, their home country. Because of that, they weren't acculturating and they were stressed out and frustrated all the time. It's just a picture. So what happens here, this is the tunnel of transition. There's... You know, for you to become who, for who you are right now, to become who God wants you to be in the next season, as He leads you towards the final goal, you need to change. Okay? The more you resist change, the slower the process. The faster that you yield and surrender to change, you yield and surrender, say, okay, Jesus, I surrender here. The faster you do that, the faster you'll be able to move through the stages, becoming who God wants you to be. And so the tunnel of transition is called wilderness. God had to lead Israel through wilderness so he could lead them to their promised land. I remember um, a major change and transition happened for me. My first seven years as a missionary in Tibet, there's no Christians. There was no church. I had to. I was doing prayer and fasting and intercession and evangelism and.